Good evening and happy Thursday. Thanks so much for joining us. My name is Tanisha Shade Spade and I'm your host for American Gardener. We are live tonight. We've got our guests in the studio. We've got a lot of things to cover. So let's jump right in and have our panelists introduce themselves and tell you a little bit more about their expertise before we jump into their show and tell. So Kent, we'll start with you. Hi, thank you, Tanisha. Mm -hmm. I'm Kent Miles. I'm owner of Illinois Willows. We are a specialty cut flower grower. Uh, we're located in Western Champaign County and I can answer questions on uh, woody ornamentals, cut flowers, um, some perennials and that. Excellent. Hello everyone, I'm Candace Hart. I'm the State Master Gardener Specialist located here in Central Illinois. Uh, and I can touch on just about anything home horticulture related, specifically annuals, perennials, uh, flowering plants, things like that. Last but not least. And I'm Phil Nixon. I'm an extension entomologist with the University of Illinois. And that means I'm into bugs. So if you've got a question about insects, I'd be glad to help you. Wonderful. Okay, so as I mentioned, we are taking calls this evening. Give us a call, 333-3495. We're going to do a couple rounds of show and tells, and then we're going to take your calls. So, uh, Kent, what did you bring us? Uh, the first item I brought is one of our branches that we're harvesting at the present time. Uh, this variety of willow is called uh, Japanese fantail. And... On the plant, um, you see the kind of flattening and the widening of the stems. Uh, that's fasciation, which is a natural occurrence in this type of uh, variety of plant. Also, some cut flowers will do that also, like celosias and that. Um, about 20% of the stems will come out with kind of the fans, mm -hmm. we call them, uh, the fasciation. Uh, some of them will have some little twists and turtles curls in the ends. Um, this is about the average width on them. Sometimes we've had some up to like four or five inches, so they've, we've had some really big ones. Wow. <laughs> um, a lot of this type of branch material is used in uh, Ikebana design, mm -hmm. floral design work. Um, I'll have to look that up after the show. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Ikebana? Yeah. Okay, yeah. So um, if you ever go to like to Japan House on campus, okay. um, a lot of the instructors will use this type of material. Gotcha. Okay. Um, and I was asking before the show if you could train this. Yes. And you said it just kind of. It kind of does. It kind of does what it wants. Uh, so, like I had said earlier, about twenty percent will come out fasciated. The other eighty percent will come out straights, mm -hmm. which is like what this one part of it is here. And in springtime, in the photo, uh, it shows the um, the catkins coming out. Mm -hmm. um, so we have it available in the fall and then also in the spring. Very cool. So it gives two different looks to it. Is there um, any color variation by season or by type or do no. you see some? No, um, it looks somewhat of a tropical plant mm -hmm. when it's all fully foliated. Uh, the leaves are generally about oh, six to eight inches long, kind of oval, uh, darker, a little bit darker on top than the bottom. Um, and it grows well in Illinois? Central Illinois, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Very so cool. it, it generally will put out uh, stems um, from a winter harvest in next spring, uh, anywhere from four to six foot in a season. Is there a certain time of year that you see more of a demand for these? Once you once we get um, the natural defoliation in the fall, a couple good frost, mm -hmm. um, then you start seeing it. See a lot of it in um, a lot of commercial work, mm -hmm. like in the larger cities, in their planters and mm -hmm. things like that. Mm -hmm. Very nice. And then how long, once it's harvested, how mm -hmm. long can you have it on display? Uh, you can have it for years. Okay. It'll Right now it's, a, it's in a fresh state where it's still very pliable. Mm -hmm. But um, once it's dried, it keeps the shape that it is fresh. So uh, you know, if you just wanted like a vase of it, like mm -hmm. in a corner or a table or something like that, um, or outdoor decorating for like your porch pots, um, you're you know good to go as far as the quality and lasting mm -hmm. throughout the season. Very cool. Okay, we'll come back to you because I know you've got something else to yeah. share. All right, Candace, cool. we are Very to you now. What awesome. have you got? So I brought along with me today uh, some tubers and the things that need some storing for the winter. So if you haven't gotten out to the garden yet and dug up things like your dahlias, your caladiums, your cannas, mm -hmm. those those type of bulb storage organs where 
Uh, we plant them in the spring, enjoy them all summer, but if we want them the next year, we've got to dig them up and store them for the winter. So if you haven't gotten out yet to dig yours up, you definitely still can. I just dug up these uh, cannas this past uh, weekend, um, and it's actually a great time to do it. You typically want to wait till that foliage has died back once we've had a couple frosts. Um, you cut off that top foliage, dig up your, uh, your tubers or whatever type of, of bulb you have, and then the key to getting them to store well for the winter is a cool, dry location. So if you have a basement or a heat, slightly heated garage, that's a good place to keep them. Because if they're too warm and they're too moist, then they're going to rot mm -hmm. and they're going to run out of energy and they're going to be all dried up by the time spring comes to plant them again. Okay, question. So, yes. If I am a lazy gardener <laughs> and I have these in containers, yep. I have heard people say they have um, stopped watering yep. and then just moved those into a garage yeah. or somewhere. Is that okay? Absolutely. Do, do they need to be dug up? No, as long as they are kept, like I said, cool and dry. So as long as you let that container dry out mm -hmm. and keep it dry, no, you can definitely do that. That's yeah. good for myself. Yeah. <laughs> yep. And then just start watering again in the spring. Uh -huh. and they'll... Drag the pots yep. back out and start all over again. Yep, exactly. It's a great way to do it. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Okay, Phil, we are to you with some seasonal information, right? Yes, I wanted to talk about Christmas tree pests. And um, probably the biggest pest that... Uh, that a, uh, a real Christmas tree will get uh, is pine needle scale, which uh, this particular piece that I have here is a, is a very, uh, very heavily infested plant. You can see that it's got, uh, looks like it's been flocked for Christmas almost. It's got a lot of little white areas on it and these are a major problem to the Christmas tree industry. Uh, this is one of the heavier types of infestations I've seen. And when it gets this heavy where you've got lots of, of, a, of a little white uh, scale insects, pine needle scale, uh, this can actually cause the death of the plant and, uh, and die back of it. Uh, if you get this on your own, own pines, uh, they're li much likely to be, more likely to be less common. Uh, this, is a, uh, this is a white pine off of my own, uh, my own pines. And uh, you might, uh, I have almost no, uh, no infestation there. There's a couple, mm -hmm. so there's a little one there and, and there's a couple, three more scattered around here. And the spruce growing next to it will also, also has some uh, pine needle scale on it, some little white flecks and so on. Uh, but uh, you know, when you kind of have to hunt to find them, mm -hmm. it's usually not anything to be too concerned about. Interesting feature about this insect is that it has a tendency to show up on a particular side of a plant many times. And so uh, they, uh, in fact, this particular specimen, this is a mugle pine that it came off of, uh, three quarters of it doesn't have any scale hardly at all, but to the other side is almost very heavy. And usually it's a shady side that will tend to get the uh, scale infestation. And if you have one of these in your home, at your home trees, uh, you can treat these with, uh, with an insecticide, a, a pyrethroid when the, when the crawlers are out. Uh, something like eight insect spray, uh, which is permethrin, uh, can be uh, is is effective associated around the latter part of May in 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 the areas central central part of of the Midwest, such as uh, you know Springfield, Illinois, Columbus, Ohio, uh, Indianapolis, Indiana, and then and then earlier farther south and later farther north, or actually when uh, when uh, uh, Bradyria spirea has real ripe white blooms is kind of fading out and, and losing its blooms. That's mm -hmm. about the right time. Uh, another thing, and so these really aren't a pest inside the home. They're a pest for the Christmas tree grower. And we like to support, you know, it's, it's a type of agriculture. Mm -hmm. People say, well, you're cutting down trees and killing them. They're like corn plants. The trees would not have been planted if they couldn't <laughs> use them for Christmas trees, okay? And so uh, they're a several, several year crop instead of one year like corn, but it's still an agricultural commodity and it's something that we like to support. Things that can get in, in and, and be a problem on your tree from a live tree are, are spiders and, and they will like to hide down in, in, uh, in little areas around the base of the, of the needles, the fascicles we call them. Uh, where you've got a little bit of, of cottony webbing or even this happens to be some pitch. Uh, 
the spider, spiders will hatch out in the, in the fall, many of them, and kind of hang down. And if they're warm long enough, they start coming out. There are also aphids that can come off of particularly white pines like this one. Uh, that can be a problem, particularly if their source is farther north. But the bottom line is, don't worry about these things unless you keep your tree too long. Because, the, uh, because if you start with, say, bringing your Christmas tree after Thanksgiving and get rid of it somewhere within the week between Christmas and New Year's, you probably will never have any pests come off of it. But if you leave it in for another three weeks or so, when it's really starting to become a tinder box and really a source of a heavy of a fire hazard in your house, you will start getting spiders coming out and spitting mm. spider silk. It looks like <laughs> angel hair all over your mm. all over your living room, uh, and you'll get these aphids showing up, and and uh, they'll make the tree sticky and all this sort of thing. But the bottom line is, if you if you manage your tree right and don't leave it in the house more than about five weeks at the maximum, five or six weeks at the most. Uh, you won't have any of these problems because it needs warm. These insects and spiders have to wait for warmer weather for longer than that in order to decide more like seven weeks or so mm -hmm. before they're going to say, hey, it's gotten spring. It's, it's time to go out and do our thing. Otherwise, they just sit there and they go right out with a tree. And so it's fine. So Phil says don't decorate too early. Don't <laughs> no, decorate too early <laughs> and don't leave it on until <laughs> Lincoln's birthday. We yeah. don't want them that long. You know? All right. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Let's take a couple calls and then we'll come back to your uh, show and tell, Kent. Uh, Catherine on one from Charleston. She has a question about rose bushes and mildew. Catherine, are you there? Catherine, are you there? Hello? No? Okay. Well, let's go ahead and do Kent's show and tell while we're working on the phone line situation. So. Uh, what's, your, okay. what's your other item? Sure. Uh, so my other show and tell that I brought is uh, boxwood. So this is uh, a very common landscape shrub. And we use it this time of year uh, for holiday greenery. Uh, I've been growing uh, boxwood on the farm since we started the farm, uh, gosh, 20 years ago almost. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm still cutting on 20-year-old plants. And... Uh, Boxwood can be used um, in a lot of different ways. Uh, here's an example of a wreath that I made with the boxwood. Mm -hmm. uh, it'll stay nice and green indoors. Um, generally for uh, about six to seven months, then it starts to really dry out and the color will change. And when it's usually after about a year, they'll turn to more of a straw color. So you get a different effect. Mm -hmm. It still looks the same. Uh, they don't drop their leaves. They don't make a big mess in the house, uh, but they'll just naturally dry out. They'll stay nice and green for about six months in okay. the dried state, but then they start losing the color. Uh, you can also make garlands. Uh, if you wanted something you know, like above your fireplace on a mantle, mm -hmm. uh, you can use them in porch pots. Uh, if you've got pots uh, outside still, and you want to put some decorative branches mm -hmm. and some boxwood or some evergreens at the base. Uh, makes a nice holiday decor. Um, if you're going to use it indoors, uh, just as in branches, you don't really need to have it in water. It doesn't have to have a water source uh, because it, it'll it stay the way it is and not... That's impressive that it'll it stay holds green up for that for the long. holiday season. Mm -hmm. So once you know Thanksgiving's over, you want to switch over to uh, you know a winter holiday decor. Uh, box would be, would be a really good choice. Mm -hmm. and, and it doesn't get brittle or? No, it'll just say just how it is. Huh. Um, and you can just, you know, line it down a table or a sofa mm -hmm. table, put some candles, uh, maybe some ornaments. Mm -hmm. You could do a lot with that wreath you too. Can. Hang it. Yeah, you can hang it. Candle in the center. Yeah, yeah, candle in the center. Uh -huh. uh, you, if you're having a dinner party, you can hang them from the back yeah. of chairs. Oh, yeah. I've had customers do that. Uh, they've also put them in... Um, the window panes, depending mm -hmm. on if they have, you know, mm -hmm. certain types of windows. Uh, it reminds me of the, like, the old school traditional wreaths that mm -hmm. you see on, like, Norman Rockwell paintings. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you. Welcome. All right, let's try the phones again. We've got Iran and Rantoul with a question about browning grass. Iran, are you there? Uh, yes, I am. Wonderful. Go ahead with your question. Well, uh, uh, earlier this month, I winterized my grass. So now I'm seeing some spotted golden areas. 
and and it looks like it's going throughout my yard. I was hoping that you could help me. I thought it might be some kind of mole or something. What do you think, guys? Hmm. You said you treated it, and then you saw yeah, the browning? It, yes. What did you treat with? Do you happen to remember? Yeah, I went to Rye, Scott, uh, 12, 1202, uh, 12. Okay, okay. Hmm. Are you having any, are, are they just brown, or is it kind of a reddish color, or? A reddish color, like a goldish color, yes. Because there's a rust that will uh, be associated with, with uh, damp times of, of the winter, more commonly in the spring, but it tends to have pustules that will be kind of, kind of uh, reddish looking to a certain extent. And if you walk through the dra grass shuffling your feet uh, with white tennis shoes, you end up with, uh, with reddish tennis shoes. So uh, uh, that's a fairly common rust situation, uh, which normally takes care of itself. If you've got areas that are browning out, that's uh, that's something that uh, maybe you need to need to look more into, and uh, and you can send a sample to your local extension office or to the plant clinic on at the University of Illinois campus, and they can probably uh, give you some ideas associated with it. Uh, a lot of times you'll get brownish areas on grass in the winter time due to just literally drying out, but we haven't had a lot of cold winds this year yet, so I wouldn't expect that to be the case, which makes me wonder whether it, it might be something else that's going on. And uh, w one thing you have to be aware of, too, is that many times uh, lawns are going to have several different types of grass in them, and some of those grasses are going to brown out for the winter time and give you brownish patches. So. You know, if you're in an area, if this is a new yard for you, this may be a case where you're not familiar with that there's more than one species of grass out there that'll start showing a difference as uh, winter approaches. Uh, but if you've had the lawn for several years and this is something new, then uh, then definitely I would say get some samples and try to find out what's going on. Now or in the spring? Now is do better now? than in the spring because you still might be able to do something about it now. Yeah. Uh, Likely won't, but at least you'll be pre-armed with what's likely to happen and, and whether things are going to green back up in the spring. Okay. Uh, just a reminder, we are taking calls, 333-3495. Give us a call and we'll get your questions answered. Now we're going to Clay in Mattoon with a question about butterfly plants indoors. Clay, are you there? Hello? Sorry, I was on mute. That's Hi. okay. Go ahead. Um, I have... <laughs> Uh, we need some uh, perennial butterfly plants because our fox always die every year. Say that one more time. Um, we need some perennial butterfly plants because our fox always die every year. And you're wanting to grow them indoors? Uh, no, not indoors. Okay, so you're looking outdoors. for... Outdoors. Gotcha. Okay, mm -hmm. so what do you guys suggest? Oh gosh, you'd have a lot of options in terms of, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> in terms that, of that. I told you. Um, <laughs> yeah. For, so first, figure out which location you want to put in. Put them in outdoors. So figure out what your sun requirements are. Figure out where you're putting them, a particular spot you're thinking about. Um, there's a lot of full sun perennials that so would be great for butterflies. Uh, if you're thinking about monarchs, that's a, a popular butterfly that people are trying to attract, then look at your different types of milkweeds. There's a lot of those to look at. Um, really, you just want a profusion of flowers throughout the year should be kind of your main goal. So you want some spring flowering perennials, some summer, some fall, so that you always have a, a flower source for those butterflies to come to. I wish we would have gotten a chance a to lot. ask why her flocks was dying. And you, and you might want to look into what kind of flocks you actually have, uh, because uh, I know that some flocks are very susceptible to botrytis and some other types mm -hmm. of diseases. But yeah. they're powdery mill do good. Yeah. Uh, but there are improved varieties of flocks that are less susceptible to these sorts of things and also can be planted in areas where you get a little more wind movement, usually an area that's, that's lower and, and sitting in, in, in a low spot or, or where the wind is, is uh, broken by shrubs and so on will increase the susceptibility of plants to 
to various types of diseases. So it may not be as much of that you've got the wrong plants, you may have them in the wrong spot, or you may be able to improve, if you don't have any other spots, you may be able to improve your situation by, by fitting out a sh a shrubs that are nearby, or at least uh, going into a ri raised bed situation. The raised bed will allow better drainage in the soil and get it up higher so you get a little more air movement. All these things can reduce the diseases in the plants you already have, and so these might be good options for you. All right, we're going back to Catherine in Charleston with a question about rose bushes and mildew. Catherine, are you there? Oh, Catherine, I desperately want to get you on. <laughs> Catherine, no? Okay, we're going to have to move on. <laughs> Marilyn in Effingham I'm with a question about green tomato worms. Marilyn, are you there? I am. Okay, go ahead. Yes, uh, this is Marilyn, and I'm concerned about butterflies. I want to make available as many options for butterflies I can, but I have the green tomato worms. Uh -huh. I pull them off and step on them, and I also have these green and yellow and black worms in the garden that are on dill. Okay. So I don't, I mean, I let them die too, so uh, am I doing the wrong thing to create butterflies? Yes and no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, the, uh, the green tomato worms are going to turn into a, a, a moth, a hawk moth. That uh, if you've ever been out in the evening and you noticed that something that looked like a hummingbird uh, flying around your, your, your flowers, uh, particularly I've noticed them most on petunias as well as four o'clocks and some things of this nature. Uh, chances are what you're seeing is not a hummingbird if it's an evening, but a hawk moth. And one of the more common hawk moths is the, uh, is the tomato or tobacco hornworm, uh, which, uh, which will feed on your tomato plants. Uh, an important thing to realize is that the, that the, that the tomato is in the uh, nightshade family and it has poisonous leaves for most critters. And so you're not really going to have, uh, the fruit's good to eat, obviously, <laughs> but uh, you don't eat the, eat, the, eat the leaves. And most other critters can't either. And so bottom line is hand, hand picking them off, particularly in the morning when the, when the worms tend to be up to the top of the plant, they're easier to see then. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can pick them off and squish them, uh, do a tap dance on them. Uh, but, uh, but you could also, if you want to go with sprays, that would, you're not really harming anything else. Now your your caterpillars that are that are multicolored that are on your that are on your dill and they would be on fennel and parsley and carrots and so on. This is uh, what you described as the larva of a black swallowtail butterfly, which is a black butterfly with some with some uh, spangles on it and light colors and so on. It has about a five inch wingspan. It's just a fabulous addition to the garden. In fact, in our garden we plant fennel and dill and primarily for the butterfly larvae uh, to attract them and, and to have them. And they really don't cause a real lot of damage there. In other words, you should be able to coexist with the, with the caterpillars. Let them eat part of your fennel. You eat part of the fennel. <laughs> leave the rest of the fennel for the fennel to keep growing with, and everything will be happy and hunky-dory. So, <laughs> so, uh, so that's why I said yes and no. Uh, you probably don't want the green tomato worms. They can really decimate your plant. Mm -hmm. Uh, you can eat a quarter of a tomato plant in one night when they're big, but uh, you know the, the parsley worm, which is another common name for the black swallowtail butterfly larva, is not really a problem usually, and you can kind of live and let live there. Okay. All right, Candace, we're going to go to you for a question about arborvitae. This is Charlie from Sherman says, we noticed issues a couple years ago when there was a drought. We watered it, and it seems to stop the dying, but, when, but we had bagworms. We sprayed the tree with seven. That seemed to stop the dying, but now the dying looks to be spreading. We do love these arborvitae as they provide privacy and sunblock to our garage. So can they be saved? Yes, more than likely. Maybe not the whole, the whole planting, but um, some of it more than likely. So you said a good word there, Charlie. You said drought. And one thing about arborvitae is that they're very drought susceptible. When, you have, when we have a drought summer, you see a big loss of arborvitae because their root systems are rather shallow. They don't have a very extensive root system. So you did the right thing by watering it. You might have started that a little bit too late just based on some of the, the dieback that you had there. And if you did notice uh, bagworms, then spraying for those would also be a great thing. But uh, it, I would be interested to know what time of year 
Um, you did spray for those bagworms, and Phil could tell you a whole lot about bagworms, I'm sure. Um, but the time to spray for bagworms would be late May and early June, when they're out of their bags and they're actively uh, going to be able to be hit by that spray. So if you'd sprayed at a different time of year beyond that, then you might actually still be dealing with some uh, bagworm infestation. So one of the first things I would do is would be to go out there and look up close to that planting to see if you do still notice uh, bagworms on there because they still certainly could, um, you'll notice the bags on this time of year. Uh, you can hand pick those off this time of year. That's your only uh, kind of control that you can do at this point. Um, other than that, I would just keep monitoring those, checking for those bagworms, making sure you are watering when we do have drought conditions. And it's kind of going to be a wait and see uh, kind of game to see if you get, um, if that continues to spread. Um, if you do notice any type of yellowing on the tips or any type of pattern showing up, then it could also be a disease issue coming in. So I would take a close look at that too. Uh, and you can always send a sample to your local extension office or the U of I plant clinic too, just to rule that out as well. Great yeah. answer. In 30 seconds or less, can and you tell us a treatment to spray on uh, Well, I would soil. rather add on to what? Oh, do you want to we'll add to bagworms? We'll save yeah. it. We'll save and, it. And that yeah, is that you it. can easily control bagworms <laughs> with BT, mm -hmm. uh, BTK, Bacillus thuringiensis gerstaki. And I would spray about a month later than, than Candace just said. Candace is right for the southern part of the state, but as you get up in the central part of the Midwest, you're looking around the 4th of July, 2nd half of June. Nailed it. Okay, so in conclusion... Get your wreaths from Kent, get your bulbs out of the ground, yep. and be careful when you pick your Christmas trees. <laughs> We're out of time. Thanks for watching. Make sure you find us on our socials, and we'll see you next time. Good night.